All right, welcome in hockey fans to another edition, another episode, if you will, of the Pro Hockey West Report. As you can see, we are live tonight, and for really good reason. The start of the uh, hockey season is upon us. Scott Strandy, Stephen Marsh with you from the um, Sharks Ice, let's call it that. We're going to be at Tech CU Arena uh, this weekend, but uh, right now they're putting the finishing touches on getting ready for the rookie NHL Rookie Showcase, the rookie face-off, if you will. Nick Maxson joining us from back in the studios in Minnesota. Um, guys, uh, it all starts for real tomorrow. Next thoughts. It really does. And, you know, Scott, what an exciting time. You know, the, the NHL's hashtag, is it October yet? Uh, it's very close. We're two weeks away uh, for all the hockey fans and for us uh, here in the NHL media spheres. This is the most exciting time of the year. It marks our official start of the NHL season. And uh, I'm excited to get it going with, uh, you know, trying to see what the young guns look like for uh, some teams out there. And we have six of them here this weekend, Scott. So excited to see what uh, this rookie faceoff tournament has in store and some names that are going to emerge that maybe we haven't. And also see how some of those big names that we expect uh, to perform here as well. So it's exciting times. Before we By the way, in, Scott. Hold on a minute. Before we dig into okay. that, let me give you some insight, Nick. One of us <laughs> took a trip from uh, Denver to Phoenix, Phoenix to San Diego, San Diego to San Jose. Uh, and the Phoenix to San Jose part was all done in a car. And uh, somebody got up early this morning to make sure that he was here to pick up someone else at the airport. Meanwhile, that other person took a flight from Vegas, got a whole row to himself, flew in comfort, flew in style, landed, got picked up in about 15 minutes after he got to the door. I mean, what's the deal here? Somebody's got it all going on and somebody else is working like a dog here. Stephen Marsh, how are well, you? <laughs> well, it's like the song goes, it doesn't matter if you take the car or you take the plane like I did. Thanks to Southwest, it was a smooth flight. But we found the way to San Jose, and that's the most important thing because it, it, may, it may be kind of tricky getting here. But uh, as the song goes, you got to find the way to San Jose. And you and I did, Scott. You took a little bit more of a, of a little bit of a different route uh, with, with the travels you had to go through. But, yeah, for me, it was just a nice hour and a half flight from Vegas this morning. Flight was about half full. Didn't have, you know, I guess nobody wants to go to San Jose, I guess, except I guess us little hockey, hockey bozos that want to cover this thing, which is, which is great. We I'm, love to be here and we love what we're going to be able to witness over the next few days. But, but yeah, everything, uh, everything is nice up here. All right. So Nick and everybody listening, if you hear stuff in the background, we are live. As you this is tell. live. Yes. Uh, so, so lots of stuff going on. We don't know what's going to happen for the next hour, but what we do know is for the next four days, there's going to be some really good hockey and there's some really talented players on the ice. Um, some guys that you've heard of, some guys maybe you haven't heard of. If you're NCAA hockey fans, you're going to know some NCAA players that are here from a lot of teams. So uh, I guess that theory of pumping up is actually happening. So uh, we're excited about it. We're excited to bring it to you and then kick off everything and, uh, and get rolling for real in the month of October. But this is when it all starts. I mean, the guys are in, they're ready to play, they're ready to face off, and they're real games against real opponents. 100%. And, uh, Scott, I think I, I think what we need to do is start off with uh, Tech CU Arena, again, where this is taking place. Uh, it's a brand-new arena for the AHL affiliate of the San Jose Sharks, the uh, San Jose Barracuda. Uh, I know that you haven't quite gotten the full you know, tour that you I think we were hoping, and you're going to spend more time in the building in the next couple of days. But uh, from what you saw, this seems to be quite the new addition to the AHL arena sphere, so to speak. I think the key word there, Nick, was addition. And I'm gonna let Stephen dig into it because this is his this is his coverage area. But um, it is an addition to the Sharks Ice. One thing that I was impressed with today, Nick, when we walked in, Stephen and I came in, and there was so many kids skating, figure skating, just open skating, people carrying hockey bags. Uh, five different rinks set up around this little uh, rectangle that's very close to uh, San Jose. Um, what's the name of San Jose State University? San Jose, San Jose State, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, Stephen, take it away. This is your this is your hiding spot. So go ahead. Oh. <laughs> no, I. This is this is a uh, it's a it's a great place. It's a big place, as you mentioned, Scott. And uh, it's uh it's it's there's a lot of there's a lot of ice sheets. Um, as you said, it this this is an existing facility, but they just added on with the arena part. The arena has about five thousand seats. Uh, I think it's a little bit less than that technically, maybe a little bit more. Somewhere in that range, and uh, yeah, we were able to 
see it from the outside. And we also we've seen pictures. They had a grand opening a couple of weeks ago. This is what they're going to be their first really big event in the new building uh, with this uh, rookie uh, with this rookie face off. There'll be two games in there each day. Um, the Sharks, of course, will get the, the 7 p.m. game each day, obviously, as the host team. Uh, but there'll be a two o'clock game uh, in there. There'll also be a, a 7 p.m. game in there. And then where we are here in the orange rink, there'll be a game in the middle each day. So there'll be a few few games in here too. But overall, it's, this is a great setup. You know, last year we were in Arizona, and uh, you know that was that was a that was fine. But uh, I think out of the two that I've been to now, it seems like first impressions. I'm I'm liking the setup here uh, here in San Jose. Nick, let me tell you, um, this is the NHL rookie faceoff. So a lot of these guys will be playing in the AHL, but it's really their first experience of life in the NHL. I think uh, Stephen and I have talked about this before, that they travel uh, with the NHL plane usually. They travel with NHL uh, per diem probably uh, in their hotels. And everything is treated first class for them because they want to give them a taste, right? Because where's better incentive than uh, having this opportunity and seeing what it's like to be an NHLer? And uh, maybe you elevate your game a little bit more. You know, it's interesting you mention the off-ice aspect of these rookie tournaments, Scott, because we're always so focused, too, on the on-ice product, right? And you got to remember, as you mentioned, these are young kids, either fresh out of juniors, fresh out of college, um, fresh out of maybe, uh, uh, say, an ECHL or a Tier 3 type. And, again, it's that this is what life could be like for them if, you know, they, their cards play the right way. Um, I think it's interesting that – as as media, we look at these things, and, and again, with these rookie showcases, some of them have been professionals for a year or two. Some of them, again, have never stepped foot on professional ice as a professional player. And this early is to give them, like you said, a taste of life, what it's like to travel, what it's like to be in a hotel with a roommate. Also, game day preparations, you know, prepping your sticks as they've done previously now. But now it's just things just, it's the whole experience, right? I think it's cool that these young kids are getting that opportunity. Um, again, this is going to be an event where crowds will be available too. There are tickets that folks can buy able to watch these players and a lot of young players i know we'll get to them a little bit later in the show that i think a lot of us should be on uh, especially with these six uh, teams that are in uh this particular tournament but it's all about the entire experience on the ice off the ice it's that whole kit and caboodle and how fun for the players it is for us to be able to watch this thing unfold them to have an nhl type experience throughout this entire four-day strip well and keep in mind too that this these, these games are all going to be streamed online i think uh, there'll be audio streams available for people to listen to uh, for the respective teams. So there's there's exposure there. Uh, you know, we, we talk about development camps and how important those are. Uh, I think Will Nickel, the uh, player uh, development guy for the uh, Golden Knights, uh, met with members of the media in Vegas today before they left for San Jose. And and they were talking about how, you know, a development camp is kind of like a an orientation, kind of like a, a, a learning kind of off-ice stuff, you know, like classes and a bunch of things like that. But now you get into a rookie camp situation where, they're not going to just be playing against themselves. They're not just going to run through drills. They're not going to run through practices. They're going to get out and play players of other teams in this sort of setting. And it gives them a chance to really show off them against other uh, teams and how they can do against, uh, you know, other teams in defending and goaltending. And, and there will be a lot of player personnel from the different teams here. Certainly the six teams that are represented here, maybe some others from other teams that might come and check, check this out and see what, see what sort of players are, are participating. Um, sometimes the NHL coaches, Coaching staff to make an appearance at these as well, uh, so it's 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 a good opportunity for for that to ha that all take place uh, during these next uh, four days. So. Yeah, I totally agree with you on that, Stephen. And I think also the thing to remember is these guys are putting on the real u uniforms, right? They're putting on the real jerseys, socks, pants, helmets. I mean, it's like a real NHL game for them, um, and it sounds uh, crazy. But it means a different, I mean, there's a difference between putting on the NHL jersey and the AHL jersey. And maybe they'll go back to their junior team. Maybe they'll uh, get a shot and play in the NHL. Maybe they'll go back and play AHL. But either way, it, it's an experience that they're never going to forget, right? And uh, all of these guys are looking forward to it. They've all been uh, very successful. They wouldn't be here if they haven't been. But this is their time to shine if you can. They get a weekend. They get Friday, Saturday, a Sunday off, and then they get Monday to really show what they can do and what they, and, and and all you hear around right now is that uh, these guys have put in a lot of work over the summer, whether it be on their own or with the teams or or back in their colleges or 
those junior camps or wherever it is, but they put in a lot of effort to be ready for this. So uh, I expect a, a lot of good things like we normally see in these, and certainly San Jose is ready to put on a show. Now, will we see a fight in, in, in this? Because I remember last year, oh, at we least will. one of the we games, <laughs> <laughs> there's always a guarantee you're going to see a, a fight or two. Uh, I mean, I, I remember last year that it happened in the, in the game between the Kings and the Golden Knights in the last day. There was a, there was a fight between a couple of the players. So uh, that's almost uh, a guarantee that, that you, you're going to see that too. Because, again, these players are, want to show off their physicality and stuff. Even though fighting may be down in, the, in, in hockey in general, uh, they still want to try to prove themselves and, and if somebody does something they don't like, they're going to stick up for themselves. Show that they can stick up for their teammates. Show that they can stick up for, for them, for themselves too. So it's it's just another uh, another aspect of, of the game too. Well, I think Stephen and Scott, you know, and I'm glad Stephen you brought that point because the the whole idea of and I think uh, for hockey fans out there, it, the big question is, you know, so why have a rookie face off? You know, why do these things? Yeah, there's there's opportunities for coaching for these younger players is opportunities, uh, you know, to kind of have a talent evaluation. Um, but as you mentioned, Stephen, it, and it's also for some players, it's, it's to make an impression, right? Sometimes it's fighting, not just to stick up for a teammate and, and what is essentially a meaningless game. But it's also, if I'm a player that I believe has more of a physical edge to my game is to make an impression on the coaching staff that yes, I can hang with the, the big boys per se, you know, the HL and the NHL level. Uh, but Scott, what's precious to you? Why do these things happen, right? Because we have the NHL, uh, we have the face off down here in San Jose. There's others, a Traverse City tournament up in Detroit. There's another one happening up in there in the Northeast. Why do teams come together and have these sorts of tournaments? What's the whole purpose behind it? Uh, I think the whole purpose behind it, guys, is that they're, uh, they're trying to showcase this talent. I think, as we mentioned earlier, they're putting on the silks, if you will. Uh, they're getting to live a weekend uh, as an NHL or they're, they're you know, it's a learning experience, but also somebody in a different uniform. And and to Stephen's point about the fights, um, there's guys that are going to have tough guy roles, if I can use that in air quotes. Uh, so those guys have a style to play, right? Your defensive guys have a style to play. Your offensive guys have a style to play. The goaltenders. So when they're all trying to showcase, why not do it against other teams? And, you know, it's a fun event for the fans. I mean, a, a local place like San Jose now, uh, their fans are going to get a chance to keep future NHLers um, right in front of them, up close and personal. 100%. Uh, tonight, by the way. Yes. Um, with that being said, let's, let's pass it on to Steven. Hey, uh, Steven, so as the uh, Zamboni is happening behind you, again, this is a live production. Again, this is live, you know, exactly. You know, so, uh, you know, we're doing it live, as they say, right? Yeah, um, exactly so, right. Exactly. But, you know, what's your take on, you know, besides showcasing the talent out there to the fans, is there really a, an organizational benefit from putting on these tournaments and, and for these uh, younger players as well? Because as we look at the rosters, and we're going to get to these rosters a little bit later in the show, but if you glanced at them, a lot of invitees, a lot of uh, players that are not drafted or under contract, there's some invitees to these rosters. So there must be another reason why these things are happening, too. Yeah, I think so. I think I think you're right. I think you, you, there are a lot of invitees. Uh, obviously, a lot of the draft picks from the last few years are on there. I, I just think I, I just think it's a good opportunity for the for a lot, many teams, and especially out here west, where a lot of these teams are in close proximity uh, within each other, to, to put something on like this for a few days. And the effort that the teams hosting it can can host it and sell tickets and whatever they can do to show off. Uh, the rookies, because again, this is the future of the the NHL, and and yes, not everybody that will play over the next few days will make it to the NHL. Always, that's everybody's dream, but not everybody will. But there will be some players from this group, uh, from these different teams, that some have played NHL games already. Some are obviously vying for the NHL. Some have played American Hockey League games. Some have played overseas, and I think it's just a, a another way for these teams to be able to get a look at what they have in their system. And be able to do it again. Development camp, you 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 can do that, but you can't see it against live competition. Well, you can do that in this kind of a setting. And of course, this leads right into regular training camp. And some of these guys, you know, maybe they impress and they get us. They get invited to regular training camp. They want another look uh, with the NHL guys and, and get some looks and some skates with them in training camp. Uh, I'm sure that's happened many times where somebody's impressed in something like this or or development camp, and they say, you know, maybe we'll invite this guy to to come to training camp 
for for a week or so and and see how he is uh, maybe before but they wouldn't do that in, in the past so uh, i think that's good for that as well and i, I just think it's never a harm in in getting more off, more looks more eyes on these players um because these guys travel around all year long watching these guys play in different settings but now you get them all in one place and you have a chance to to see to see them in action 100 percent. so scott let's uh, let's go back to scott here uh scott do you have anything to add um to what stephen marsh was uh discussing here um i i think at the end of the day uh a lot of good points that stephen brought up but uh, anything you want to add yeah, you know, I think the one risk that you, you have in something like this is obviously injury, but you can't you can't stay away from it. You have to uh, get out and face it. And you'll see the guys this weekend. Uh, we'll be competing. They'll be checking. They'll be skating. Uh, the last thing that they're thinking about is being injured. So I, I think it's just a good way to start the season. And especially when you have young talent, uh, you need to get them out there and, and uh, see what they got, if you will. And this is proven to be over the I mean I remember four or five years ago and it was up in uh, in Summerlin uh, it was a lot of fun because the talent level was so high and I think we're going to see the same thing again now I mean we're going to get to the rosters after the break but when uh, you hear some of the names you're going to go okay okay I've heard of him yeah I expect this out of him so that's what I think is, is the best part of this whole deal so let's do this, guys. Uh, if we uh, we've kind of established now what the rookie faceoff is, um, I think we should just do a quick schedule recap for those who uh, uh, will be joining uh, and maybe in the area um, who want to uh, maybe go see a couple of things. Um, so for the rookie faceoff starting tomorrow, correct? So there's three games each day. Um, so Friday the 16th, uh, starting with the Los Angeles Kings and the Colorado uh, Avalanche. They're 2 o'clock at Tech CU Arena. Uh, the second game is 4.30. That's the Vegas Gold Knights and the Arizona Coyotes. That's at 4.30 in the afternoon. And then the last game of the day, the Ducks and the Sharks, 7 o'clock back at Tech CU Arena. So, again, some opportunities to go into the new building there for the fans uh, for either squad there. Saturday, a couple different uh, mix-ups here. It's the Kings and the Golden Knights at 2. Again, Tech CU Arena hosting that. Ducks and the Coyotes at 4.30, again, at the Orange Rink. And the Avalanche and the Sharks at 7, again, back at Tech CU Arena. A Sunday off is a good a day of rest. Uh, Monday the 19th is the wrap-up of the day. Uh, Coyotes against the Avalanche at 10 o'clock in the morning, so a little bit earlier, trying to get the tournament wrapped up. Again, Tech CU Arena, the Ducks and the Golden Knights at 12.30 in the Orange Rink. And then the final matchup, of the weekend it will be the Kings and the Sharks 3 o'clock at Tech CU Arena. So nine games over the course of four days. A lot to like, a lot to be excited about. With that being said, uh, guys, let's take a quick break. And when we come back, we'll do our roundtable. We'll talk about the rosters with these squads and who is in. Some names that we may like to see and maybe some surprise guys. So we'll take a quick break and we'll be right back. The NCHC, where the best in college hockey compete, and the numbers back it up. In the past eight years, six teams in national title games that are run of four consecutive national championships, two Hobie Baker winners, and 46 All-Americans. More than 70 alumni in the NHL with multiple Stanley Cup champions, a leader and innovator in the sport, including a -a one-of-its-kind pod, one conference, creating champions, and improving the game. This is the NCHC. Really, JR, you think you can still do this? I'm focused. You're way too old to hit that target from there. I've been listening to everything you said. It's been running through my head, locked and loaded. Alright, still got it. Still got it. Who's old now? More than 140 live games from the nation's best college hockey conference. Ready for you, wherever you are, however you want to watch. Your favorite team is on nchc.tv. On your phone, tablet, or stream to your TV. Subscribe now to watch the best in college hockey at nchc.tv. If it's nchc hockey, it's on nchc.tv. All right, welcome back, everybody. Somewhere we lost Stephen Marsh in the shuffle. 
uh, he turned into a black screen instead of a. <laughs> He'll be back. Uh, I will. He'll be you, back. <laughs> uh, it's live. It's live tonight, folks. Live here from the Shark Ice as uh, part of the uh, rookie face-off, the NHL rookie face-off. Six great teams. We're going to get into those in just a minute. Talk about uh, uh, some of the guys that are there. Um, we have two teams to talk about, so we'll uh, we'll break it down for you. I'm impressed with my two teams. I know, you, Nick, you probably are with yours, and even yes. if he comes back to us, he's probably just as excited. <laughs> if not, we can, never, we, we can definitely, uh, you know, so <laughs> we can definitely uh, do some input for him if he needs. Are you guys so. not seeing me? No, you're a black Still a screen. black screen. <laughs> really? That's okay. That's anyway. okay. So Scott, let's let's do this. So I'll, I'll you know let's take a stab at it, right? So I'll uh, I'll go ahead and uh, start with uh, I think the first team. I think the biggest uh, team that uh, I don't think I will have my eyes on this season. That's the Anaheim Ducks roster. That's going to be here. Uh, some yeah. big names, um, a lot of uh, college hockey flair too with this roster. So I think uh, let's start with the uh, we'll start with the forward group here. So a couple of big names. I think no question people will be watching. Uh, number one, Mason McTavish um, again. Yeah. Uh, Hockey Canada captain, um, I think it's not tied, but it's not set a record for a world junior champion as far as points. Um, so he's going to be one that I think not only will participate for sure um, in this rookie faceoff. There's no question in my mind if he has the type of uh, performance that he was able to replicate up there with Hockey Canada. I think he's already punched his ticket um, to the Anaheim Ducks regular training camp, which will take place after this tournament is there. That's the one name to definitely watch out for. Um, uh, for my Minnesota player, how about Blake McLaughlin? Uh, yeah. Former uh, Minnesota Golden Gopher um, there. So uh, he'll be joining here as well, the Grand Rapids, Minnesota native. Um, uh, 33 points in 39 games played um, for the Gophers there um, over the course of his uh, last season. Um, so, and then also spent uh, just a little bit of time with the American Hockey League uh, last season. Just got in seven games, did have one goal um, in his seven games there. Uh, third round pick by the uh, Anaheim Ducks. So, just a couple of names that I take a look out for. But another guy to take a look out here, how about this? As far as a fourth round selection, Ben King. And the reason why I put his name up there uh, is a recent fourth round pick here this year, uh, the Tysdale Saskatchewan native. How about this? Uh, in 58 games played, uh, excuse me, excuse me, not with Swift Current. He's with Red Deer. Uh, 68 <laughs> games played, I'm sorry. Uh, 52 goals, 53 assists, 105 points um, for the 2022 fourth rounder. That's some impressive numbers. Uh, Scott, just out of the three names that I mentioned, uh, just some reactions. I, I know you know Mason McTavish. So how about the other two, Blake and also Ben King? Uh, ben King is is it's one to watch. Let's put it that way. He's, hey, Steven's back. He's back. I got him back. <laughs> Guess who's back? <laughs> <laughs> I was about to just come over and join your shot there, Scott, if you weren't going to get can, me on. <laughs> can, can we just break into a little Backstreet Boys or something like that? Something anyway. like that, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, we were talking about Ben King. Uh, he's a guy that is definitely what we call a finisher. He knows how to put the yes. puck in the net. And uh, I think there's a lot of uh, – uh, Anaheim Ducks that know how to put the puck in the net. Uh, so I'm looking forward to seeing him and seeing what he can do at this level. We know what he can do, obviously, at the junior level. Um, so we'll see. Uh, I think another thing to mention, guys, is that uh, the oldest player here, I think, is 25. So it's not like this is a, an old group of, of, of veteran players or, or even AHL veterans. There's some, but not, not that far along. So it truly is rookie status. Um, you mentioned Mason, Mason McTavish. Uh, that kid is still eligible. I call him a kid because he's still eligible to play in the World Juniors this year should he yes. choose to do so. Now, mm -hmm. I doubt that's going to happen uh, unless uh, you know he does not make the uh, Ducks roster and, and chooses to do that or really wants to set the record for Team Canada. But, man, if he comes back, that is a feather in the cap of Team Canada, even if it's only for a couple of weeks in December and January. 100%. And uh, almost forgot about Nathan Gauthier as well, the uh, Quebec native that potted 31 goals here. There was their first uh, round pick there this year. So he's another guy to keep a watch on the four group here for the Anaheim Ducks organization defenseman. Um, how about this? Uh, Drew Hellison, uh, the Farmington, Minnesota native, again, Boston College. Uh, just a little bit uh, there for uh, for Anaheim. There four goals, twenty one assists, twenty five points in thirty two games. So a pretty good season there for the for BC Eagle. 
Um, I think the biggest two names, though, um, are going to be uh, is a Tristan Luno and Pavel Minik- uh, Um so a, a couple of offensive defensemen uh, there, and then also uh, just Owen Zellweger, uh, the the yeah. former uh, the former Everett uh, Silvertip, and then Noah Warren as well. Uh, some guys that can be a little bit more offensive. Uh, Stephen or Scott, any of you two have uh, any of these names that uh, have some familiarity with? Go ahead, Stephen. You got anybody there? I, well, I mean, I, I think I remember a little bit. Um, I guess Olin Zellenberg played a little, they didn't play any games with San Diego last year. But, um, you know, a lot of these, these guys have had a lot of success in where they've come from, whether it be in Quebec or Russia. So I think it's it's going to be exciting to, to see the defense. Well, obviously, the defense the defense core is, is an important aspect of the game. And I think the Ducks have had some great uh, defensemen come through the, the organization in the past. So, it's always uh, it's always good to see where the, the where the uh, depth chart is for the defensemen in the organization, and I think we'll get a good look at that uh, this weekend. And then well, finally, just one goal. Oh, sorry, Stephen, go ahead. W- no, Scott, just one sorry. more point. Scott. Yeah, one more yeah. point that I want to throw out there is um, these are not just skilled defensemen; these are skilled puck moving defensemen. Yes. And if you have forwards like the uh, Anaheim Ducks system has, it's really good to be able to have some guys that can move it out of your zone and get them going freewheeling, if you will. So I think the Ducks are going to be a high-scoring team in this uh, little face-off. And then, uh, yes, and then just finally one goaltending name to keep watch. I know that the John Gibson conversations are still alive and well, but a guy that maybe uh, will be a replacement, how about Gage Alexander, their 2021 fifth-round pick um, at 140th overall. And the reason why I bring up his name, he's six foot six. 205 times. He's a big uh, goaltender again, native of Octox, Alberta. Has a pretty good numbers last year in Winnipeg in the WHL. Uh, 2.4 goals against average um, for him in 29 games played. I don't have a save percentage number, uh, but uh, that big frame, you talk about a, a big goaltender, why more NHL teams are starting to go for that 6'4, 6'5, at 6'6. Six, six. Uh, man, if he's in the butterfly, his I believe his shoulders are still covering the crossbar. So that's uh, that's there's not a lot of room to shoot at a goaltender of that size. Yeah, it, it's interesting that you say that because there's been a lot of talk about that, about big goaltenders and, and smaller goaltenders. And uh, as many people know, that I had a chance to uh, do some preview stuff in our NCAA teams. And I've seen three teams so far in preview them that will be coming up at the start of the, uh, the NCAA season. But the unique part of it is I saw Arizona State, I saw Denver, and I saw Colorado College. And they all have three goaltenders on their roster. And all three of them I consider to be above average. A couple of them are really, really good. And um, so when you look at these guys and and you wonder, and and there's a big discrepancy, and I'll I'll throw out a quick example. Um, TJ Semptenfelter, the, uh, easy for me to say, uh, the goaltender at Arizona State, who looks to be the number one, the transfer from Northeastern, is 6'1". His two running mates, if you will, are 6'5 or 6'6". And uh, TJ told me when I visited with him, he said, you know, even though they're bigger than me and have a different style, I still pick their brain because I want to know what they do, what they see and how they cover the net. So TJ will get it done on athleticism and uh, quickness. And those other two, Gibson Homer and, uh, and Ben Cross, will get it done with their frame. But uh, one thing that a lot of people have also talked about is the pucks coming across the, the blue line these days they get down almost immediately because they don't want to get beat five hole. They don't want to get beat on the ice. Uh, mm-hmm. if, if somebody's going to beat them, they want them to beat them over a shoulder or over a glove. Uh, so if you're six, five, six, six, and you have some athleticism, which you know, these guys do, um, they're going to be able to cover a lot of net. hundred uh, percent. Let's do this. Uh, since we do have Steven Marsh back, Steven, let's grab uh, your first team. I'm um, here for the evening. Uh, who do you got? Do you want to uh, start with either uh, Vegas or who do you want to start with? Uh, sure. We'll start with Vegas. Um, yeah. So the, some of their uh, forwards, we're going to, of course, see, we're going to see Brendan Brisson is going to be involved in this. Of course, um, yes. that's somebody as you come into this camp and as you go into main training camp uh, next week is somebody that might actually have a, an outside, not an outside chance, maybe more than an outside chance of actually making the yeah. NHL roster when the season begins. I mean, just because of the situation with, with the salary cap, although that's 
seems to be cleared up a little bit with some LTIR stuff, but but still they're going to need some players probably on the on the cheap that can be really productive uh, and and effective for the team. And certainly he's high on there. Of course he's he's had quite a busy summer. He had development camp here, and then then he's did some training in in Michigan, and then he he got to spend some time there. And then of course he went over to the uh, rookie thing that they did in DC with some of the prospects to there, the little showcase there with some of the some players from different teams in the league. So uh, he's he's been training hard, and he's he's uh. He's ready to he's ready to go. He's ready to, to play in this. And uh, he talked to the media today after the uh, after the their skate today in Vegas. And uh, you know he's I think I think and that's another thing we talk about with develop with development camp too. A lot of times during the summer, a lot of these players are are a little bit out of shape. But now they've they've had a chance to train during the summer a little bit, and so they come in and they're a little bit more um, they're not as winded and they're able to to be a little bit more. Uh, in tune and with what the what they need to do, uh, so obviously Brendan Brisson is somebody that's going to be uh, really looked at this this weekend. Um, I guess another guy would be uh, Zach Dean, who's their their twenty one twenty one draft pick. Um, he's they're actually going to try him in a couple of positions. Uh, uh, he's going to be in uh, I believe he's going to be a, a winger, and he's also going to be in uh, in center. I believe uh, they're going to kind of he's I guess he's done both, but I think they're going to give him a crack at. At, the, at that a position that he's not normally doing recently. So they're going to give him a, a chance to do both this weekend and kind of see how that goes. Um, of course, we're going to be looking at Connor Ford again. He's somebody that, of course, has been with uh, Henderson a little bit late last season and then a little bit, uh, uh, of course, before that, of course, finished off his NCAA career with North Dakota, Bowling Green before that. So, uh, of course, he's still pretty new in his pro career. And uh, he's somebody that's really uh, – really embraced this organization and has done went on the part of the road trip that the Golden Knights did. And, and uh, he's, he certainly is going to be somebody that's probably going to end up on Henderson next year. So uh, he'll be part of this. And then I'll mention one more in the forwards group. Um, uh, and just because it just happened is uh, Patrick uh, Gee, G-U-A-Y. He, he just signed a, a contract, a, a AHL contract with, with the, uh, of course they, they just drafted him in the 2022 draft this year, fifth round. And they signed him to a two-year uh, AHL deal, I believe. So they obviously was impressive in development camp. They 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 liked what they saw, and they decided to give him a two-year uh, contract. So it'll be fun to see him in this setting uh, this weekend, and then see maybe if he gets a, a look in, in, in main training camp, which I would imagine he would if if he just signed that AHL contract. So those are some of the forwards uh, from the from the Golden Knights group. Uh, Patrick G- uh, Guy, as you mentioned, is a kind of wow. a curious case because, uh, again, the, the numbers that he had last season are, are pretty nuts. If you actually looked at his production uh, for those uh, at home in 68 games in the QMJHL, 55 goals, 49 assists for 104 yeah. points. But the big knock on him because, again, he was taken in the fifth round. There was some in uh, Jordan Gustafson that's here at this camp, taken in the third round. His numbers aren't quite impressive, but uh, for Patrick, it may be the stature, only five foot nine that he's listed at. Do you think that has something to do uh, with uh, where he was drafted? But obviously, as you mentioned, they must have been made some type of impression because he earned himself an AHL contract for a couple of years and has a chance to prove even more here uh, here at the Rookie Showcase. Yeah, no, I I, I... – Absolutely, I think it's it's really uh, interesting to see how it's going to play out. And I, I, I mean, like I said, they they really thought uh, Patrick did a good job with that. Um, and I think with uh, with uh, Gustafson, yeah, he was drafted in a in a up earlier round, but um, you know, and and but he's going to still have to you know get some more looks and stuff. But um, I guess it's it's always just kind of interesting because sometimes a player that's drafted later. Um, really impresses and maybe, um, you know, it really impresses and then what another player does. That's why I think it is important that these camps take place and these sort of situations take place because um, you might, you might see something that happens and they really play, play to what they can do. And it's, it's exciting. Uh, as, well, I think Minnesota Wild fans know very well what a fifth round draft choice uh, can yield <laughs> as far as results. Uh, Stephen, how about maybe a defenseman and maybe a goaltender that uh, they should be watching if you're fans of the Vegas Gold Knights that may be on the up and up? Well, certainly, uh, Caden Korzak's going to get another look in this rookie tournament. Uh, of course, yeah. he's he's probably high on the the defense uh, depth chart within the organization. Uh, if you look at last season, 47 games in the uh, American Hockey <laughs> League, only had two goals and 12 assists. 14 points, but um, he's. I, I would expect him, and I think the Golden Knights are expecting him to have a really good year. Uh, this will be, I guess, his second full season, I guess. But, um, you know, the season before this, he had to go back and forth between the juniors and, 
and the AHL. So uh, that'll be exciting there. And then uh, I guess the goaltender, there's only two goaltenders that are on the roster for the Golden Knights, and that is Isaiah Seville and uh, Jesper Vickman. Of course, Isaiah Seville coming off a, a career with Omaha in the NCAA. And then, of course, got eight games in the uh, American Hockey League last year, of course, with Henderson. And looked pretty good in those games with Henderson. He really had to come in because there was some uh, they needed him and, and they needed to win. And, and he came through and, and had some strong games. And so that he's already had some AHL games under his belt. So that'll be good for him as he goes into this rookie camp. Let's do this. Uh, great insight there for Vegas. Uh, Scott, you got a couple of teams. It's uh, Arizona. Um, is one of them as uh, as well as Colorado? Is there anyone in particular you want to give a start with? Um, we're going to start with the Arizona Coyotes because uh, they're in a very unique position. Um, they've got they a are. lot of young draft picks. Um, as you know, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I had a chance to visit with Steve Potts and the head coach of the Tucson Roadrunners, and uh, and he said it's it's difficult this year because there's so much talent that they've drafted, but they're going to be stuck away from the AHL unless they make an NHL roster. They're too young to play in the AHL, which is unique in hockey. So uh, they're going to bring a couple of guys that you're going to want to keep your eye on. The first one is going to be Connor Geeky, uh, their, their recent draft pick. He's a big kid, plays hard up and down the middle of the ice, uh, six foot four, uh, has a lot of developing to do and growing into his own body, I think. But uh, he can be impressive. And the one guy that stuck, stuck out last, stood out last year was uh, Dylan Gunther. Who, yes, uh, he did. Pro- probably could have made the roster last year. Was that good? He was one of the best in the rookie faceoff, and uh, they sent him back to juniors, and he developed, and he developed, and he developed, and now he's back, and uh, he's going to make one of these two teams, I think. And uh, I don't be surprised if he's not wearing that Coyotes jersey a lot longer than just this weekend. Um, he also looked at a couple of guys that they they brought in, two NCAA guys that people that have followed us for the last seven years will know Nathan Smith, uh, mm-hmm. a big leader at uh, Minnesota state, uh, getting a great opportunity to play in the Coyotes organization where uh, if he proves himself, he can find a spot um, not only with the AHL roster, but possibly with the NHL roster. Um, and then the other one that's kind of the dark horse, dark horse is Colin Thiessen came mm-hmm. in from Notre Dame, played a year at Arizona state, quickly accelerated himself last October to the captain of Arizona State, led them in scoring, uh, did everything that they asked of him, uh, got a chance as a free agent to uh, go down and play with the Coyotes, or I'm sorry, the Roadrunners last year uh, for just a few games toward the end of the year, but really made an impression. And they're looking forward to seeing what Colin can bring uh, when they come back out this year. So, um that's a forward group. Anybody got any comments on uh, the, the Arizona Coyotes forwards? Yes, I do. Uh, I think one notable name that isn't there, uh, and I think a lot of uh, Coyotes fans may have wanted to see Logan Cooley is not there. Uh, he's obviously with the Gophers and their development camp as they're getting ready for the start of their season, uh, which also starts in about two weeks as well. So uh, that's one big one that they're missing. But as you mentioned, Scott, I think for the Coyotes, uh, there's a lot to like about where the direction of this team is going in terms of actually building to the draft, getting high-end prospects. Again, three first-round picks, all forwards. You mentioned Dylan Gunther. We talked about Logan Kaleo as well as Connor Geeky. Uh, there's no question me Geeky suits up for the Coyotes that this season. I have zero doubts that he will uh, spend any time in the American Hockey League. But, uh, you know, I, I know the Coyotes have been sort of uh, a team that uh, has had their uh, their off ice issues, but it seems like with uh, the new GM and, and just in terms of the hockey operation stuff, there's a lot to like about where this team is trending. And finally, you know, gathering the draft capital and spending it wisely, I do think that this is going to be a team that kind of surprises people this weekend at the rookie uh, faceoff down there in San Jose. And a lot of high end talent, so I think they're going to be a fun team to watch. Totally agree. I will tell you on the defensive side of it. If you know any of these names that play on the defensive side of it, uh, raise your hand. Somebody. Steven, raise your hand. <laughs> Somebody. Uh, these guys are, are a group of unknowns, relatively unknown. Um, but I don't even know who to tell you would be a breakout there. I mean, Gerald Keeney is pretty good. Um, uh, Leighton Moore is, is, is solid. I, I know a little bit of these guys, but really they're unknown. So this is their weekend to show what they got. Uh, so that's the way the defense is going to roll. I think uh, defensively or uh, in goal, the, uh, the Coyotes have, for years, had a pretty decent stack of goaltenders. 
now they're almost all gone. But one name that comes mm-hmm. back is Kendick, uh, David Kendick, who's been around for a little while. Uh, he's coming into his own. He may he may get a shot to win the starting job for for the American Hockey League. I don't think he gets into the NHL, but. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what happens. And, and like I said, the, the, in the Roadrunner situation, Coach Potvin's in a unique situation because he has to go get some older guys because the guys that they drafted just aren't old enough to play in the AHL yet. 100%. Which I hope they change sometime. If you're going to have the AHL right. as a development, change it. 100%. Uh, another goaltender, Derek Baribo, a former wild draft capital, uh, not offered a qualifying yeah. offer. So he comes into the Arizona Coyotes organization on a tryout. He's a, a big frame goaltender, also at six foot six. So there's a familiar name there, uh, at least uh, for some uh, Midwestern hockey fans. Uh, let's yep. continue. Let's continue well, forward, I, shall we? Just, oh, sure. I, go I ahead. Yeah. To, to close things off with Arizona, I want to. 2022 that's the operative term here for uh, arizona because it's either everybody was either most of the team is either drafted this year or their tryouts that they just brought in for this year so it's as you said it's a very it's a very unknown thing and it's a obviously a lot of players that are either new to the organization or are, are obviously coming from other organizations so that will be uh, an intriguing thing to see how how the, the team gels even though you want to win these things it's not all about winning but just how these players do and and have a chance to to get an opportunity with with the Coyote organization. Hundred uh, percent. Let's move forward uh, just to make sure that we stay on time here for us here today, gentlemen. So uh, my second team, Los Angeles Kings roster. Um, no question to me that the uh, the the biggest thing that uh, Kings fans will want to see and how he's progressing is Alex Turcott. There's no question to me that oh. he's the guy that they want to see. So. American Hockey League, um, not as productive, I think, as uh, I think he was hoping. Only six goals in 27 games. Yeah, he played eight NHL games last season, didn't register a point. Again, he was their 2019 well, first I, round I pick think he was, overall. I think he, was hurt, I think he was hurt a lot last year, too. So he was, was, yes. Yes, yeah. he was hurt, but I I do think that you know for even the year prior uh, to that there was uh, so, uh, I think he left more to be desired. Um, I think from the from the King's staff as well. So those no question the injuries, um, you know, played a role in his performance last season. But now he's fully healthy from what we know. But and then this is sort of like the the big prize that LA was wanting because if Turcotte can make some noise, uh, gentlemen, and maybe Stephen, let me ask you this: the Kings made probably the biggest free agent splash uh, with the addition of Kevin. Fiala, Minnesota Wild fans are crying. I know they are, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> but say you bring in, if let's say, let's say this Alex Turcott, you know, finally, you know, lives up to the potential as a former fifth overall pick in his draft year. Um, LA Kings have got some high end talent up front. They've got a good mixture of that veteran presence with Andre Kopitar. They've still got Cal Peterson and John and Jonathan Quick in the back net. It, could we be talking about a potential Stanley Cup contender in the Los Angeles Kings? Say if a guy like Turcott can come up and play some meaningful minutes as a rookie. Well, I think so. I think I think they certainly have a chance to make the playoff. Um, you know, I think last year uh, the Kings it was a bit of a surprise because everyone thought it would take some time for them to kind of get into a position where they could contend uh, and at least get into the playoffs and at least another year or so. But uh, they obviously surprised people and got in. I think. Other teams around them maybe didn't perform to their their abilities, which I think obviously helps with that. But they were able to get in and and actually have a pretty good series with with Edmonton. Obviously, took them to the seven games. So it was it was uh, certainly they could have won that series, and who knows? But it's uh, yeah. But I think the Kings are are only going to get gotten a little bit gotten better. Obviously, they lost uh, Dustin Dustin Brown, their captain, but you know he'd been playing for a long. But now they got some young guys they can. Can fill in, and I think the Kings are exciting because they they do have a lot of that young talent, and it's and it's pretty good talent too. I mean, there's obviously uh, Quentin Byfield, but there, I mean, there's like um, Nolan. There's you know, there's all these other young these young guys that have of course been with the organization for a bit that are now up with the big club, and they're getting their opportunities. So um, it goes from being kind of a, a a story to now you got to watch out for this this team a little bit, and I, I think they're going to be right in the mix for a playoff spot this year. I'm going to uh, jump ahead, Scott, here, just because, again, I want to make sure that yep. we keep this at 60 minutes. So defensemen and goaltenders, no question for Los Angeles. The two defensemen the Kingsmen want to pay attention to, Brant Clark and uh, Heidge Granz. Holy cow. Uh, so for, for Clark, how about this? Uh, 48 assists along with 11 goals, 59 points in 55 games. Uh, for Barry, uh, he was their first uh, round pick back just a year ago. And then uh, Heidge Granz as well. Uh, some pretty good numbers offensively as well for their 2020 second round pick. He's 
is probably the two big ones. And then, yes, I'm going to do a little bit of homerism here, but that's okay. Uh, <laughs> David Rennick uh, is the goaltender to watch the St. Cloud State Husky. Uh, again, you know, was uh, set career and as well as franchise records for the Huskies within his NCAA career. Um, had three games in the American Hockey League. And, uh, you know, you could say the numbers don't look perfect, but uh, as you mentioned, Scott, uh, you were uh, actually a witness to one of his games there against the Colorado. Uh, They're up um, in one of his uh, in one of his appearances and uh, wasn't getting much help in front of him. I think David will transition nicely for the American Hockey League. I think he'll be a good emergency sort of backup call um, because the Kings do have quick as well as Cal Peterson. Uh, but I think he's going to have a, a good full season in the American Hockey League. And those are some of the names, uh, at least behind the forward group, that I'll be watching if you're a Kings fan. Yeah, I'll go real quick on uh, David Rennick is that uh, I had the uh, assistant coach on from uh, – Alaska Anchorage on our podcast on uh, Monday night. And I asked him about Joey Lamaru who uh, transferred yes. up there. And he said, Joey's a great hockey player. He just never got his chance because Correct. David Rennick never left. And, and, and he goes, we thought David Rennick should have left two years ago. <laughs> 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 and so did Joey Lamaru, I think. And uh, David just hung around and hung around. So he's poised to have a really big year. 100% he is. So uh, let's keep moving forward, Stephen. Uh, you have the San Jose Sharks next. Uh, so we'll talk about uh, Homer, some Homer. names to watch. Yes, uh, <laughs> here for the Sharks uh, in this weekend's rookie faceoff. Well, I think because we're cutting, getting low on time on this uh, for the forward guys, I think a couple of people to look, to look at would be uh, uh, Thomas Bordalo. Uh, of course, came from uh, the uh, Michigan last year, of course. Really and good. Then, really good. Really good. Really, really good so uh, i'm sure him and uh, brendan Bassano looking forward to, to playing against each other uh and then you've got the of course you've got his time with the the sharks he gets he did he did get in eight games uh last year uh and then of course a couple of american hockey league games so uh that's one to look at and then another one to look at um i'll do this because i know if i don't scott will mention him it's scott reedy the uh Prior Lake mm-hmm. Minnesota guy. <laughs> Asher Nick, I feel like it's Nick Spurs Perky too with the Minnesota guy there. Uh, <laughs> but, but a really good player, though. I mean, 38 games last season, um, you know, 18 goals, nine assists, 27 points. So not too, not too shabby there. Um, he also did get to play in uh, some NHL games last season, too. So that, that's pretty nice there between uh, the Barracuda and the Sharks. So it'll be exciting to see him this weekend on the forward side. Um, uh, anybody want to comment on those or should I just go right to the defenseman side? Of the defenseman? I will say this t- just real quick, Thomas Bordalo. Yep. I got to, I was actually in attendance, uh, Vegas Golden Knights and uh, San Jose Sharks in the, uh, the friend appreciation night. It's not a goal that will show up on the statue, but he had a nasty shootout winner against Logan Thompson. Yeah. And I'll tell you, Thomas Bordalo has got a mm-hmm. sick set of hands. He's going to be a one <laughs> fun player to watch. And no question to me, we talk about players that will not just be in this tournament. He's going to be certainly a player that will be at Sharks camp here the next week as well oh that's a that's a game that's sore on the vegas golden knights fans of course that rival between <laughs> golden knights and sharks is not very positive but that also a that great game hockey was, rivalry great hockey rivalry and, Say and, that. and it was and it was the game that pretty much put him out of the the playoffs and uh and the other thing too is that i remember the sharks coming into that game you know for them it was like the biggest game of the year you know go to vegas a chance to beat the golden knights maybe hinder their chances of getting into the playoffs it was like their stanley cup really uh because of you know, the Golden Knights had beat them pretty good beforehand and stuff, and they finally get in there and, 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 and beat them. So that was uh, exciting. But anyways, but yeah, so he'll be he'll be exciting to watch for sure. Uh, on the defensive side, you've got somebody like uh, uh, Nick Cisek, who played with the Barracuda last year, uh, 53, 53 games, uh, 25 points. So uh, somebody to watch there. The um, rest of these guys, you know, you got like uh, Artemi Kinesev, uh, 60 games with the Barracuda last year. Uh, 28 points in his his game. So, uh, and then what's interesting too is they're going to have five goaltenders they're going to try to get in this weekend. You know, uh-huh. we saw the other teams yes. have two goal two goaltenders and three goaltenders, but they're going to get five in, which means they're probably going to be a lot of goalie changes in these games with the Sharks guys uh, over the three games. So they all get some time uh, in net. Uh, so you've got a Mason a Bupit, a, a Zachary Edmon, a Benjamin Gurderu, Strauss Mann uh, is somebody that's going to be. Uh, on this roster for the Sharks. 100%. Let me quickly, yeah. can I throw something in on Strauss, yeah. uh, Strauss man? Um, obviously, he's a top-end talent. Um, the uh, people in the USA Hockey Development Program talk about him in the same breath as they talk about Spencer Knight. So anytime that happens, that's pretty good Pretty good stuff. 
Uh, I believe that the Sharks felt strong enough about Strauss Mann uh, that they were able to trade Aiden Hill to the Vegas Golden Knights of all places. Um, mm-hmm. So I, I believe that, that that says a lot about what they expect out of him. So I think he's going to have a really, really good tournament. And I think you will see him in camp with the uh, the Sharks as well when things get rolling here in about a week or so. Um, so, yeah, that's my input on, uh, on San Jose. So let's uh, keep it right with you, Scott. There's one last team we have to preview, the Colorado Avalanche. Now, not maybe the most top-end talent because uh, they just won a Stanley Cup. Uh, but oh, uh, so, oh, so maybe, oh, oh. but but I'm going to be proven wrong. Yes. So that was the he's team, it, Scott. Yes. He's, he's teeing it up. He's teeing it up. I was teeing you, it up for you to hit yeah. it out of the park here. So, yeah, we'll have some names to watch here for the Colorado Avalanche here that are up, and up in the up and up. We'll go hit a home run um, out me, of the baseball stadium across the street from here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Let me tell you right now that uh, this this team is loaded, uh, certainly on the offensive end of it. Let me throw out a few names that you've probably heard before. Uh, Alex Bocage, uh, John Luke Foody, um, Ben Myers, uh, going to get his shot. Oscar Olison going to get his shot. Sampo Ranta, going to yep. get his shot again. Uh, and Cameron Wright, the unknown guy that uh, helps Denver win a national championship in the NCAA tournament, who, from all indications, is primed to be a star in, in the AHL. And who knows? He might be the first call up in the NHL for the, the Avalanche. But it's a trickle down effect, guys. It really is. I mean, when you get you win a Stanley Cup and you have talent like you have and, uh, and you have confidence in the way they shared that Stanley Cup with their AHL affiliate, uh, these guys feel like Stanley Cup winners too, even though they're not. Um, and they're going to come in and they're going to carry the torch for the uh, the big club, the NHL club. And I know they're the Colorado Avalanche, and I know they're wearing the Avalanche colors and all that. But let's be honest, uh, that that team is so loaded. How how are any of these guys going to get a crack unless there's an injury? But uh, offensively, they are just unbelievable. I'm going to scream uh, a couple of names for you on the defensive side of it. Uh, another Minnesota them. State, Wyatt <laughs> Amit. Yes. Uh, to me, he was phenomenal. I, I said anybody that would listen to me again last year at the end of the season, I said um, if the uh, Avalanche are going to need a call up this year, it's going to be Wyatt Amit. I don't think there's a spot for him right now, but if they need to call up a defense, don't be surprised if he's first on the list. He's that talented, and he picked things up so yes. fast. Uh, power play, penalty kill, top group, um, didn't matter. Uh, Nate Clerman is is with them this year and he's going to be a force to be reckoned with as well um Braden schmidt is an interesting name he's the guy that uh, can step in and do a lot of things as well uh and when you jump to the uh the goaltending side of things a couple of names you're going to know already because eustace juice as they like to call him eustace and mm-hmm. uh is going to be here and and he by the way uh, just happened to be the backup goaltender for the avalanche most of the playoffs which was uh, a position that, if you know what happened to uh, to goaltenders in that series, uh, he was just uh, literally one injury away from being in the Stanley Cup final. So to have him here, that's going to be a nice backdrop. And then Trent Miner is a kid that they they like so well that they let the Minnesota kid go, uh, the UMD goaltender go. Um, <laughs> I'm not even going to say it. I'm not going to say it. I'm going to stay away from it. They let him go because they feel like their depth in goaltending is that strong that they, they want to give them an opportunity to go somewhere else. Bulldog, I'm sorry. Uh, I love having you around, but um, that's just the way it goes. Talking Hunter Miska, right? If I recall. Yeah. Correctly. Yeah. Okay. Okay. You said it. <laughs> I said it. <laughs> you know what? Uh, no, leave it to well, let's, to let's, say let's say this, but you know, let's, <laughs> let's talk about the other Minnesota state guys. Why a lot? I mean, it's, you talk about his versatility. You talk about how good he is. He's one of the better shutdown defensemen that I've seen covering NCAA hockey. Um, and he's a shutdown defenseman with skating skill. This is a guy that can skate with yeah. it. He was monumental in, in shutting down uh, for the best, most of the game in Denver. He was a big reason why Denver was having a lot of offensive fits because of why I'm on. He can play physical, but he can also skate uh, one of the better shutdown defensemen again uh, last year in college hockey. And I think, as you mentioned, making a nice transition to professional hockey. And uh, I'm with you. I think if the Avalanche have any sort of injuries in their back end, he's the first guy that they make a call to the big club up there in Denver. Yep, totally agree with you. Um, it, I, I just think, like I said, I'm going to go back to that trickle down effect. When you have a, a successful parent club, uh, these guys, and again, I'm going to say it, they're wearing the Avalanche colors. It's an Avalanche. It, it's not a, a minor league thing, but it's a rookie thing. And uh, 
the trickle down effect just just bleeds, right? I mean, they had guys uh, that they honored um, that that maybe played just a game or two, you know. Um, so look for the Avalanche to do some really good things this weekend. I think there's guys that have a lot to prove that that want to try to crack that roster, but let's be honest, uh, how are you going to crack that lineup unless there's an injury? There's just too much talent on the big club. I 100% agree. Uh, so, gentlemen, we got about uh, three to four minutes left. Let's uh, maybe close that with some final thoughts. Uh, uh, some things that we expect, some things uh, as far as previews as we're heading into the NHL season with the six teams we have uh, here in the building, um, for the two that are there, I should say, here back in, in Minnesota. Uh, Steven, uh, I guess between uh, Vegas and San Jose, uh, as far as maybe this is a hot take time, uh, what do you expect uh, out of uh, either of these teams uh, coming up? In, in, and keep it at two minutes, if you could, uh, for their NHL seasons respectively. Oh, well, I, I think for the Sharks, it's going to be a chance to kind of get back into the fold of, of the division. Obviously they've been down towards the bottom the last uh, couple of seasons. And I think they're going to try to look at getting uh, back into the fold and see if they can compete with the, uh, the topper echelon of the, the Pacific division. Uh, Vegas is going to be interesting because uh, I think there's a lot of unknown with this team, obviously a new coach coming in. Obviously that's the same with the sharks. They've got a uh, new coach and a new GM there, but a uh, new coach coming into Vegas, a new, a whole new staff there. Um, you know, there's, the goaltending thing is going to be interesting to see how that plays out with Leonard not being able to play this season to see if, if it is going to be Logan Thompson or Lauren Brossois, if he's good to go, or if it's going to be Aiden Hill, who they just brought on, of course, who they just got from the Sharks. So uh, that's going to be interesting to see what happens, obviously, if Brendan Brisson can get a, a spot on the roster and how the, the forwards are all going to line up, if this team can stay healthy, um, what that's going to look like. So uh, I think Vegas is going to be – I think it's going to be – interesting to watch Vegas, not because maybe we expect them to, to like dominate, but like, what are they going to be? It's almost kind of like year one where people are not expecting yeah. Vegas really to, to make the playoffs or, or to really do anything. And so maybe that's what they like, you know, obviously year one at work when they were the new team and what they uh, went all the way to the Stanley cup finals. So uh, maybe they could thrive again as a little bit of a, of a misfit type thing is nobody expects Vegas to, to get in and maybe they, they can surprise people and, and, and have a really good season under Bruce Cassidy. Scott, you have uh, the Colorado Avalanche, the reigning uh, 2022 Stanley Cup champions. I'm going to separate both them and Arizona because they're kind of in different situations. So let's start with Colorado. Uh, so uh, what about Colorado? What do they do this year? Uh, trickle on effect. They're going to be very, very good. If there's a team that could defend their Stanley Cup, uh, it, it's the Colorado Avalanche. Again, it's going to come down to health. That's what it is right now. And they got to get used to their new goaltender. Uh, that they went out and got and uh, and see what they can do. But their depth is phenomenal. It, it, it's really about health. It really is. And uh, they're close to a deal with Nathan McKinnon now. Uh, that will probably happen before camp opens. So I look forward to that. When you jump to the uh, Arizona side of things, it's rebuild, right? And mm -hmm. everybody will tell you it's uh, about a three-year deal. The, the biggest thing for them is how are they going to adapt to their new 4,700 feet surroundings? Mm -hmm. uh, and interestingly enough, and just a quick comment here, Scott, uh, for Arizona, they've been uh, very active on social media and we're talking ticket sales. It sounds like it's actually been quite the hit <laughs> at Mullet Arena. Um, at, the, at least the figures that I saw was around 4 million, uh, at least yeah. tickets that were sold last season. Now it's what, 16 and a half? Or so, and this may be just revenue numbers, but it sounds like <laughs> the opportunity to see a game at Mullet Arena has uh, really attracted uh, the Arizona hockey faithful. Yeah, they're doing a lot better than they did at Gila okay. River Arena. <laughs> what, what, what can I say? It, it's 4,700 seats. Um, would you not go to it? And if you were a smart person in Arizona that loved hockey, would you not buy up season tickets? Because guess who you can sell them to? You can recoup them with uh, Chicago, uh, Montreal, Toronto, um, all of those teams coming down in Vegas. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, if, if you wanted that, that purpose, you could certainly do it. They're going to be high on the resale market for sure. Very much yep. so. Uh, new is also surrounding their stadium. We are expecting here sometime this fall as to uh, the fate of the Arizona Coyotes. Um, so uh, we'll have to keep an eye on that. Uh, for my two Houston, teams. Houston, 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 Houston,
Houston, get ready for uh, for your NHL team to arrive. There. Yes. <laughs> and then for my team to quickly rack up Los Angeles, I think I'm going to go to bold take. They are going to challenge the Edmonton Oilers for the number one spot in the Pacific Division this year. I do think that they are a balanced team up in front. Uh, I do think of, as long as Drew Doughty is healthy um, and they get good production out of him, I think Los Angeles is going to be um, a, a, one of the top two teams in the Pacific Division. I do think they're going to give right. Edmonton a run for yeah. their money. I do think they're going to be that good, especially with some of the offseason additions that they have made. And then last but not least, Anaheim Ducks. I'm actually going to temper expectations a little bit. This team is going to be incredibly entertaining to watch. There's no question they were last year, but I do think that they're just a, still a little bit young. I, I know for John Gibson, who has been uh, sort of the backstop uh, for that organization, he's going to have another terrific year uh, in that uh, keeping them in games that maybe they're not supposed to. But I do think that uh, the Anaheim Ducks will be a, not a playoff team, uh, but they're going to make strides. They will be better than last year, but I still think their youth uh, and their maturity as a group is still going to need another year to uh, sort of, you know, have some time for growing pains, but they're certainly going to be a, a fun team to watch. So uh, with Trevor Zegras and some other young guns yeah. that they have coming up, Mason McTavish, um, I predictably will be there. I think they're going to be a team to uh, certainly keep an eye on. So um, uh, any how, last how, words for you guys? How much How much do you think that teams are are looking at film this year about how to stop Trevor Zegras going around with the puck and sticking it in the net? <laughs> I will tell you this. <laughs> I, you know, it's you can watch film on that move all you want. The fact yeah. that he does it in stride, how quickly he does and how much it. control, um, it, it's so difficult to defend. Yeah. As a goaltender, yeah. I mean, granted, you try it in street hockey, you try it in open hockey, you try to practice. So this kid does it with such, yeah. you know, fluency during games. Again, it's not like he picks the puck up like Mike Legg did it as he was with Michigan okay. against the Gophers. Um, and you have time to see it happen. He literally picks it up in stride and throws it um, top corner of the back of the net. And mind you, he did that at one of his, one of his own forwards. So he's able to control even <laughs> outstretched hands. It's nuts. The skill on display from Zegras is, is fun. A big reason why he's on the cover of NHL 23. So, yeah. well, any yeah, team with nuts. him, any team with him on it is going to be exciting to watch. It may not be a good yeah. team. I think of the, the baseball, uh, the the Angels. Uh, they have two of the best players in the game, in Shohei Otani and Mike Trout. But look at them; they're not a playoff team, but they're still fun to watch because of what those guys can do. And so it's, uh, you know, so it'll be fun to watch the Ducks, especially to see what kind of year Trevor Zegers does have. I got, well, the rest of the I got two words to close it out for the Anaheim yes. Ducks. It's Ryan, Ryan Getzloff. Without him, mm -hmm. they, they need to find that maturity. Yeah, that's what it'll take. Hundred uh, percent. That's gonna be of... yeah. That's gonna be strange not having him on on that team after all those years of playing with the Ducks. Hundred percent. So with that being, gentlemen, we have plenty of hockey to watch for the next four days. Uh, nine games uh, to cover. Uh, we'll definitely keep everybody posted here on the Pro Hockey West Report for Stephen Marsh, Scott Strandy, I'm Nick Max, and thank you for joining us here in this live edition, episode eleven here, coming to you from Tech CU Arena, and we'll see you back here in the saddle next week. Thanks for joining us.